The Jerusalem Channel is made possible by viewer support. Thanks for watching. The Bible is a book about the origins of mankind, but it's also a predictive book about the end of man's rule on earth. That will happen when Jesus returns to reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But the second coming is the subject of much skepticism and even outright mockery that many even in the church want to sweep under the carpet. Both the Apostle Peter and Jude, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus, predicted that in the last days scoffers will follow their own ungodly desires. And one of the wonderful doctrines of historic Christianity that they will mock is the second coming of Jesus. So how can we know that the Lord will return? Well, in this program, I'll give you four reasons to anticipate this blessed hope. Hello, I'm Christine Dark. I can say with certainty that Jesus is coming again. And the first reason that I believe he'll come again is because he said he's going to come again. You see, Numbers 23, 19 is a verse that declares that God is not a man that he should lie. And Jesus promised in John 14, 3, that he's gone to prepare a place for us and that he will come again to receive us, his bride to himself so that where he is, we may be also. This wonderful book, the Bible, which has been the roadmap of my life, records the beginnings, the origins of mankind and of our universe. But it also records in many prophecies, culminating in the end in the book of Revelation, how things are going to end. You see, God hasn't left us in the dark. The skeptics, the fault finders, and the mockers have only inhabited God's world for a minuscule comparative bit of time. Yet they want to arrogantly assume, uh, believe in evolution, that history will have no end. So who are we going to believe? For many years, I've been a student of eschatology. That's the study of end time events. And, and despite what many godless evolutionists teach, the Almighty left us a record of how the world began and he's also willing to tell us how things are going to end. He's declared the end from the beginning. This is because he lives outside of time and can see the end from the beginning. Furthermore, Jesus listed for us all of the signposts of his imminent return, including the regathering of the nation of Israel. Now, in 2 Peter 3.3, 3, the apostle Peter warned that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So if we join the skeptics and the mockers, we'll be without excuse because the Lord told us to look for certain signs and they're all around us, especially the reappearance of the state of Israel and the city of Jerusalem that's once again under Jewish sovereignty. Israel and Jerusalem are the two major end-time signs. But even before the coming of Messiah, the Hebrew Scriptures also foretold end-time events. For example, in Daniel 12.4, the prophet Daniel was instructed that his writings would be sealed until the time of the end. That verse says that many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Well, that verse has certainly come to pass. Science and technology have increased exponentially and nowhere faster than in the state of Israel. My husband and I are constantly traveling in one month. We could be in India, in Israel, in America preaching because we are moving to and fro, as that verse says. It's just almost impossible to keep pace with all of the medical wonders and technological gadgets in the increase of knowledge. There are now cars with rooftops made of solar panels for energy. The floor of our ministry center in Israel is swept by a robot. 
And yet, with all of our technological advances, the world is at the point of extinction due to advances also in warfare. Well, in this Bible, there are more than 300 prophecies concerning the Messiah. But so far, Jesus has fulfilled only about one-third of those prophecies. There are more than 200 prophecies remaining that Jesus will fulfill upon his second coming. The Bible's track record concerning the first set of prophecies was not wrong, and the other prophecies involving the second coming will be fulfilled right on God's schedule in the most minute detail. The Apostle Paul taught in 1 Thessalonians that Jesus would first of all descend in the air and gather his church to himself. When my parents of blessed memory died, we buried them, of course, and they went on to be with the Lord, their spirits, whom they served all of their lives. But when the Lord descends with a shout and with the trump of God, my parents and all believers who've died in Messiah will be resurrected and caught up in the clouds with those believers who are alive at the time of the Lord's coming. And I hope to be one of them. This is called the rapture of the church, which is the first stage of the second coming. When Jesus comes to claim his bride, the church, this will be the end of the church age. And at this point, 1 Thessalonians doesn't say that the Lord's feet will touch the Mount of Olives. It says he will descend into the atmosphere and snatch away his bride. That's what the word rapture in Latin means, to snatch away. The Lord must return for his bride, you see, and then Israel will once again become the main focus of God's attention immediately prior to the Lord's return when he actually sets his feet upon the Mount of Olives. Then he will set up his rule from the throne of his ancestral father, David. That's another prophecy that yet remains to be fulfilled. The angel Gabriel promised Mary, the mother of Jesus, that her son would occupy and be given David's throne. Well, this will be a future event. And during that time, Jesus will judge the nations and separate the sheep nations from the so-called goat nations. In those days, the Lord, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, whose picture is already prophetically on the Jerusalem flag, he shall roar out of Zion. We're presently living in Psalm 2, which asks, Why do the nations rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Listen, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. That word anointed is Mashiach, Messiah, which means the anointed one. But the psalm goes on to say that he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. You see, even if the United Nations fights God and his anointed son, God's final decree on the matter is heard in verse 6 of Psalm 2, where he said, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And as Jesus confirmed in John 5, 22, the father judges no man, he said, but he's committed all judgment unto the son. And so Jesus shall separate them one from the other as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Some will go into the kingdom and some will go into everlasting punishment. Jesus will be the judge who will determine all of these things. And as the son of David and the son of Solomon, he will judge with right judgment and he will divide the nations those who have been obedient to God's word and who have served the nation of Israel versus the rebels, the goat nations. Well, I've been preaching all over the world recently in Ireland and also in India that we're living in the prophecy of the Apostle Paul set out in Romans chapter 11. And those amazing verses that I'm living in, verses 25 and 26, which prophesy that when the fullness of the Gentiles is brought from the nations into the church, then and only then will all of Israel be saved. God's going to take out his church first. The fullness of the Gentiles is a Bible idiom for the full measure 
of the body of Messiah, which is the church throughout history of real believers. When the Gentile church is full and complete, the church goes out and then God returns to his program for Israel in a very intense way. The fullness of the Gentiles refers to the church age. It began in Jerusalem here at Pentecost and it will end at the rapture. But as soon as the rapture happens, the blindness, the hardening towards Jesus will be removed and taken away from Israel. And the prophet Zechariah prophesied, they'll look on him whom they've pierced and mourn for him. All of Israel shall be saved, but it won't happen until Jesus completes the building of his church. But already this is beginning to happen, and I'm an eyewitness. In my nearly 44 years of involvement with the nation of Israel, I've seen the progression of the times of the Gentiles and of the beginning of the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. These events are running parallel presently. At this time, God is beginning to restore the kingdom back to Israel. And the kingdom was not restored to Israel at the time of Jesus' first coming because the national leadership rejected salvation in his name. But they will receive him upon his return. This is a major reason why Jesus must return to restore Israel to the kingdom and to restore the kingdom back to Israel. And of course, that's why Iran and Israel's many enemies are satanically inspired to try to destroy Israel before this could ever happen. But thankfully, God is fully in control. Not just Israel, but all the surviving nations are destined to worship the Lord in Jerusalem. This city will become the worship capital of the world. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Yes, Jerusalem will once again be his address. Can you therefore understand why there's so much controversy over Jerusalem and why there's so much controversy about nations putting their embassies back in this capital of the Jewish state? This is the city where a Messiah will soon be ruling. But the nations are rebelling against God's end time plan. However, Isaiah 59, 20 declares that the Redeemer will come to Zion, to this city, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins. Yes, he's going to come to Zion, not to Brussels or New York or Washington, but to Zion, to the mountain of the Lord in Jerusalem. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. According to Acts 1.11, this same Jesus will literally return to Jerusalem. Not a ghost, not a reincarnation of Jesus, not a false Messiah, but this same Jesus who nearly 2,000 years ago made atonement and became the Savior of the world. This same Jesus has promised to return from heaven to this earth, and I believe him. He's not a liar. I've walked with him for all of my life, and he's never lied to me. And his word is perfect. Refined as silver is refined seven times. So reason number one why I believe Jesus will return soon is because he said he would come. During the preaching and teaching of Jesus' life and ministry, he made many frequent statements regarding his return. And many of his parables are related to the second coming. Jesus' famous Olivet Discourse is about his second coming. But now a second reason that I want to discuss for the Lord's imminent return is a reason that I don't think I've spoken much about in previous programs, yet it's something that I've often meditated about. And that is Jesus must return, not only because of the promises he made to us to return, but because he simply must be vindicated. The second coming of Jesus will vindicate the degradation and the humiliation that he suffered. The world will see him for who he truly is. The rejection of this man of sorrows, the dishonor that the world put Jesus through demands that he returns so that his exaltation and glory 
can be seen and marveled at by the world. You see, the rabbis teach that there are actually two sets of prophecies concerning the Messiah. The first set describes Messiah, the son of Joseph. In other words, the Messiah who was humiliated like the patriarch Joseph in the Old Testament and who was sold by his jealous brethren. Many prophecies such as Isaiah 53 concern Messiah, the suffering servant, Mashiach, the son of Joseph. But there are other prophecies of exaltation concerning Mashiach ben David, Messiah, the son of King David. These are the many prophecies of a triumphant ruler. Jesus has already fulfilled the humiliating prophecies concerning the suffering servant, the man of sorrows. What now awaits him is the fulfillment of the glory prophecies. The roaring lion of the tribe of Judah must return and be vindicated as the glory of the Lord fills the entire earth. The four Gospels are narratives of the ancestry, the birth and ministry of Jesus, as well as his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. For the past nearly 2,000 years, he's been very busy fulfilling a different ministry as our intercessor and high priest in heaven at the right hand of God Almighty. The book of Revelation reveals the risen Lord Jesus' role in his glorified body in his heavenly ministry. Jesus still has a work to be done, however, on earth in his glorified state. And the world has yet to see that. The return of Jesus will be the greatest vindication of this word of God and of the Lord Jesus himself that this world will ever witness. And I can hardly wait. Although Jesus was surely vindicated by his resurrection, nevertheless, only believers actually saw the resurrected Lord. But at his second coming, all eyes will see him as he truly is. There'll be no mistake. The second coming in power and great glory will be a vindication extraordinaire. The New Testament very carefully lists everybody who actually saw and handled the risen Lord Jesus. But there wasn't a mocker or a skeptic in the bunch. That old fox Herod didn't see him, Pilate who crucified Jesus didn't see him, and the high priest Caiaphas who condemned him didn't see him. Only the believers saw him. But the Bible predicts that the tables will be turned at the Lord's second coming. The whole world will see his glory. This word of God demands it and promises it. Isn't that spectacular? I think it's wonderful. You see, Psalm 22 is a messianic psalm that Jesus actually quoted from the cross. It starts out with a cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It goes on graphically to describe the deep degradation and the humiliation of a crucifixion. It says, Dogs surrounded me. All my bones are out of joint. They pierce my hands and my feet. They cast lots for my garments and so forth. But God, who inspired the Bible, also sees the end from the beginning. And that's what I'm trying to communicate in this program, that Jesus may have been humiliated to work the work of atonement, but he will be vindicated. This same Messianic Psalm 22 concludes triumphantly with a vision of the Lord's second coming. I want to read you the glorious conclusion of Psalm 22, which starts out with all of the suffering. It says that all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he is the governor over all of the nations. All of the rich of the earth will come and feast and worship him. And they will bow down in the dust and kneel before him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. And they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn. You see, that's the bigger picture. The Lord has done it. 
Hallelujah. The second coming of Jesus is the whole picture of his ministry fulfilled. Jesus, meek and mild, is only half the story. So don't overlook the fact that the greatest vindication of Jesus is coming. And that's when Jesus returns in triumph and all other religions will be proven to be false and inadequate when the lion of the tribe of Judah prevails. At his trial, Jesus didn't try to defend himself because he knew that he must first suffer and die in order to achieve atonement for Israel and for the world. He had no choice but to obey and to endure and go through with the agony. But even at his trial, when he was put under oath, Jesus prophesied about his second coming. He testified before the Sanhedrin very boldly. When he was questioned, he said, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And to this, the scriptures agree. Revelation 1-7 declares, Behold, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the earth, of the earth will mourn for him. The third reason Jesus must return is to receive the rest of his ministry. Not all of the ministry of Jesus was fulfilled at his first coming. That was the hard part. Now he will receive the glory, the rule, and the millennial kingdom. And he will live with his body, the church, forever and ever. And no power on earth will be able to stop him. He's coming with great power and great glory, and every knee will bow to him. It's a Bible principle, indeed, that God exalts all who humble themselves. And this certainly pertains to the Lord Jesus more than anybody else. The shame, the degradation, the abasement, the disgrace, the condescension, the suffering and his self-effacing submission to God, his loss of face, the indignity, the dishonor to the Son of God, the emptying of himself, the humiliation of the Messiah crucified as a common criminal. All of this sorrow demands that he be vindicated publicly upon his triumphant return and he will return so that he might receive the glory due to him and receive the kingdom. He must return to receive the throne of David. But there's another reason, a fourth reason, I'd like to squeeze into the remaining moments of this program of why Jesus must return. I've always hated a usurping spirit and the great usurper, Satan, will be exposed for the fraud that he is and will be put down by Jesus in front of the entire world when he returns. The Bible teaches that Satan shall shortly be crushed under the feet of believers, and that the delay is one of the great mysteries of the New Testament, while the fullness of the Gentiles is brought into the kingdom. It seems Satan is allowed to roam the world, wreaking havoc, but his evil activity will not go on forever. But just for a season, while God has us in spiritual boot camp, training us for eternity. This delay is mentioned in Revelation 10, 7. The idea being that time is short and that the fulfillment of God's mysterious plan will be suddenly delayed no longer and Jesus will come. The good news is that while we see people becoming more and more filled with hate and lawlessness, the Lord is coming soon to deal with evil. Legally, he destroyed Satan at the cross, but Satan's activity and ability to roam will be bound for a thousand years when Jesus returns. The book of Revelation also teaches that Satan will be loosed at the end of the thousand years, but only so that hearts can be tested, so that those who lived and were born during the millennial can show their loyalty to Messiah. And then and only then afterwards will the rebellion be put down and Satan will be banished to hell, to the lake of fire forever. So my friends, I encourage you not to grow weary in waiting for the glorious appearing of the Lord from heaven. 
The trial of your faith, according to the Apostle Peter, is much more precious than gold. And in Titus 2.13, Paul admonished us to look for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus, the Messiah. This is not a false hope. It's truly our blessed hope. So don't let anyone rob you of this blessed hope through mockery or intimidation of your faith. The scoffers have lived in this world only a couple of decades or half a century or so in your lifetime. Yet the word of God has outlived the mockers and the naysayers. So don't pay attention to them. The degradation of Jesus at the hands of mere mortals demands that he return and receive the homage and glory that he truly deserves. The present exaltation of Satan demands that Jesus return and take back the earth from Satan's tyranny. Did you know that those who love the Lord's appearing are promised a crown as an eternal reward? And it's the easiest crown to win because it's based upon desire. I'd like to bring my thoughts to a conclusion today by pointing out that I discovered in the book of Revelation that Jesus testified at least five times in that one book alone where he said, Behold, I am coming soon. So either he's telling the truth or Jesus lied. Whose testimony are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the puny mockers and the scoffers? Or will you believe the promise of the King of the universe, the Lord Jesus, the Son of David, who is truth personified? I've settled the matter in my heart long ago, and I believe all the signposts point to the fact that he's coming very soon. The question remains, are you ready for the sudden appearance of the Lord in the sky? And how can you be ready when he comes? It's so important not to delay your surrender to the Lordship of Jesus so that when he comes, he appears as your bridegroom and your savior and not as your judge. You can't save yourself and the church can't save you. Only the savior is worthy to save you. So here's the key. The Bible teaches in Romans 10, 9, that if you're willing to declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Take this to heart. In the meantime, keep looking up and keep doing the exploits of the Lord. And we'd like to invite you to stay in touch through social media and through our website at exploits.tv, where you can click online to receive our electronic newsletter, Exploits, and where all of our videos are available for viewing around the clock. We also post prayer points in our website that will help you to be an effective intercessor for Israel and the nations. And so always contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem, I'm Christine Darg. Shalom. The Jerusalem Channel couldn't exist without you, the viewers, who make our broadcast possible. I can't say enough how much we appreciate your comments, your suggestions, and support. From the city of the great king, I want to tell you how much we value your prayers also. As the people of Israel say, Todah Rabbah, thank you for being a part of this ministry.